Lately, there's been a worrying rise in the number of police-related deaths and serious use of force. Just in the last couple of months, we've had the tasering that led to the death of 95-year-old Claire Nowland. Then there was the shooting of Stephen Pampalian, who was killed in the driveway of his Sydney home. Both were armed with knives. Claire was suffering from dementia. Stephen also had serious mental health issues. And a few weeks ago, a police officer was found guilty of assaulting a First Nations teenager in a Sydney park in a video that went viral. Now, hearing about these cases is a nightmare for Lisa Topic, whose 22-year-old daughter, Courtney, was shot dead eight years ago by police in the car park of a Hungry Jack's. She was also armed with a kitchen knife. She also had serious undiagnosed mental health issues. These cases have all prompted investigations and calls for a change to training. And in a sec, we're going to hear from a criminologist who's worried about the shift that happened during the pandemic that went from community-focused policing to what he says is a more force-orientated model. But first, let's hear Lisa's story. Lisa Topic, thank you so much for joining us on The Briefing. What happened the day Courtney died? It was an ordinary day. Bit, bit like today, you never know what's around the corner. We went to work, my husband and I, um, our sons went and did their usual thing. Um, Courtney was at home. It was a day she didn't work. Um, she had worked the previous evening at Woolworths. She'd been working there for many years. It was an ordinary day. And then around two o'clock in the afternoon, I heard in the staff room some of the young teachers saying that a young girl had been shot dead at Hungry Jack's. And I remember thinking, how awful, how close to home, how sad. Totally, yeah, oblivious to that it was us, it was Courtney. She didn't go out alone. Um, she worked at Woolworths, which was two streets away from where we live, and Courtney would walk up and she'd have her head down and wouldn't interact with people. The only time she'd go out was with me or with her brothers. So, look, that afternoon, um, about 10 to 3, quarter to 3, my name was called over the the loudspeaker at school, as well as my principal at the time, um, to come to the office urgently. And I still wasn't thinking Courtney at that point. I was just thinking, oh, my God, what, what's going on? What Went to the office and there were detectives there and they, they told me that, that Courtney was dead, that she'd been shot dead um, by New South Wales police. And I just remember collapsing and not it didn't make sense. And then I just went into mother mode. How, how do, what do I do? Who do I, how do I sort my, you know, the family out, mum and dad, my boys, my husband, what, what can I do? And it just seems so far removed from Courtney, from us, from everything. And yet here we are um, trying hard to live our life and go forward and to prevent any other family having to live this lifelong nightmare. Um, you know, we have to get up and go to work and do our usual daily tasks um, and we do them in honour and memory of Courtney um, who didn't deserve to die such a senseless and violent death at the hands of those that are supposed to help her. Our children were brought up to, you know, if you need help, you go to the police. And yet here, you know, this kind, gentle soul who did have mental health issues, absolutely, but she did not deserve to die within 41 seconds of the police arriving. Such a violent death. Um, I guess there's been so many same, same, but different, you know, scenarios of people sadly losing their lives unnecessarily. Um, you know, this has got to change. The police need the correct training for the correct situation. It's not a one size fits all. Mental health is not a crime. Dementia is not a crime. And yet these people are dying as though they were common criminals at the hands of those that are supposed to help. Nobody made them judge, jury and executioner. Some people have said, I oh, ate years on, you must be okay by now. We'll never be okay. She shouldn't have died like she did. And if we can do anything, and we would love a meeting with the police commit, current police commissioner to discuss going forward um, in terms of making a difference to mental health training for frontline officers. If they don't have the correct training, how can they be expected to act appropriately? And by working with the police and going forward and changing the training to better encompass um, different situations, but we've got to try to make it less deadly to those that are suffering mental health issues, dementia, 
and us, the families, are left to get up each day and do what we can to make a difference. And that's why, that's why we do this. So Lisa, I'm sure you've spent so many hours reflecting on what could have happened differently and what can be done differently when it comes to police training. Where do you think the holes are? The issue of mental health has become, is growing exponentially and especially around our young people. I work in a school, I see it firsthand. More and more of the police's call out and interactions with the public relate to mental health. Now, mental health on its own is not, not criminal. So they need to be better equipped and better trained to understand and to recognise where this person is suffering in a mental health psychosis or a mental health issue. We need to change, I guess, the the, the culture, if you like, um, that everybody that the police come in contact with are not criminals. With us doing, you know, helping with training and that, it helps the police too. We're not here to beat the police. We never have been. Like I said, I've got a lot of friends at police uh, that are police officers, but what we need to do or what we want to do is to make change, positive change, so that other families don't have to live this, you know, this never-ending nightmare, basically. That was Lisa Topic. Now let's bring in Terry Goldsworthy, who's an Associate Professor in Criminology at Bond University. Terry Goldsworthy, thank you so much for joining us. First up, I'm going to ask you, is it the fact that it's been in the media, that it's on our minds, or has there actually been an increase statistically in police use of force? When you're talking about use of force, there's a whole range of use of force options that police can use. So, I mean, uh, what we know about firearms is that there was a, a surge, I guess you could say, about two years ago, where it uh, rose up quite sharply, the numbers in Australia. So if you take the timeline trend over a number of years, what we've seen is a very slight rise in the number of shootings in Australia, and it averages somewhere around about five fatal police shootings in Australia per year. So, you know, I guess people, uh, they see the police shootings on TV, they feature heavily in the media, and uh, because now we can all record and capture events for our phones, et cetera, there's probably more exposure to it. Yeah, and I guess too, often media gets body-worn camera footage released under um, freedom of information, don't they? Well, that's right. You know, the police are also capturing the moment, um, and that's uh, a good thing because it uh, provides accountability and transparency. And, uh, you know, it's good for the public to see that footage there, but it's also good for the police because it provides excellent evidence. So in some circumstances where they're not worn or they're not activated, it is disappointing to see that occur because uh, a picture's worth a thousand words when it comes to a dispute as to what happened if someone has suffered serious injury or uh, ultimately being killed by the police in their interaction. When things do go wrong, do you think the investigations process is adequate? The public often has an issue when it is an internal investigation, for example, police investigating other police. Every jurisdiction has a different setup, but uh, primarily what you usually see where there's a, what we call a critical incident. So there's a death or serious injury of a police officer or someone from the public as a result of an interaction with the police. So it could be through discharging a firearm or police officers' use of force in defensive equipment, you know, things like cap spray or uh, a taser. In Queensland, we have the Crime and Corruption Commission. They oversee any... Uh, of those issues where there's a death in uh, police custody as it's defined and New South Wales has the Law Enforcement Condu uh, Conduct Commission which overviews and monitors critical incidents. So they'll go out to the scene, look at the crime scene, they'll look at recordings of interviews, they'll observe the interviews conducted by police officers with other police uh, and look at the brief of evidence as such and make sure it's fully conducted and conducted in a proper way. All of those use of force reports are examined by, uh, you know, local committees. The police would look at the use of force and make sure it was appropriate. Um, so they do capture the data internally. What we don't see is that data being made available publicly. Perhaps the police services could uh, consider opening up their use of force reporting and making that more um, appropriate. That was Associate Professor Terry Goldsworthy and he mentioned quite a few times there de-escalation training that's occurring in many states. So I've actually sat in on some sessions with Queensland police recruits and uh, it's, it's kind of fascinating from an outsider's perspective because basically what they're told is make eye contact with people, introduce yourself 
tell them your name and ask what their name is and then use their name and find out things about them. It's kind of like, you know, social uh, chit chat 101. It seems like a fairly obvious thing to do as an outsider, but apparently this is quite sort of new and radical when it comes to the way that police interact with with people who are, I guess, allegedly committing crimes or creating public disturbance. Um, We've already seen the difference that this makes in Queensland and in other states, and you can only hope that some of these practices are going to be adopted more broadly and that we'll learn from cases like uh, Courtney Topics.